We'd like to welcome you back to part three of our current event and weekly Bible study for August 17th, 2014. We're going to continue now with the, uh, the uh, history of um, um, really Pentecostalism, Charismania, uh, and the Azusa Street Revival here. That, that's kind of what we're, we're keen on right now. Now, we ended here, and I'm just going to pick up where we left off. Uh, you have to judge the facts for yourself, as we will now look at the Azusa Street antics. Okay, so we, by, you know, a tree is known by its fruit, and that's what we're going to be looking at here. Interestingly, the Dictionary of Pentecostal and Charismatic Movements it's, itself suggests that the slain in the Spirit is not biblical. Even though that's what happens there all the time. Hey, I used to be one of those catcher guys, catching the people, or somebody would be catching me, you know? Um, I did that, and um, one time I caught this lady, <laughs> I was wearing dress pants, um, I always wore, when I was doing the chiropractic full time, I always wore a white dress shirt, full sleeves, and dress pants, and a tie, always dressed that way, and um, I catch this lady, and uh, she fell back, caught her, and my pants split from the front to the to the top, man, right down, <laughs> I think from my zipper all the way to, like, my belt, I mean, it was bad, and I don't even think I knew what happened, and somebody came up to me, I think it was the pastor, and he was like, man, you need to pull your shirt out, and I'm like, oh, no, so I know all about being slain in the spirit, being on, you know, <laughs> the catcher, the receiving end, the whole nine yards, so, um, anyway, um, they the the dictionary of Pentecostal and charismatic movements itself states that slain in the spirit is not biblical. It says that it can be it can be caused by peer pressure, auto suggestion, or self desire to have it quote have it because everybody's wanting this. You know you 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 look at it like wow they got slain in the spirit they're more spiritual than me. If it's not happening to me, I want that. That's what they mean by that. But it does not include the possibility of it being all of Satan or even partly of Satan, yet this phenomenon is unbiblical. Both babbling gibberish tongues and slain in the spirit are unbiblical. They were the basis of the Azusa Street activities which gave birth to Pentecostalism. Babbling gibberish tongues means that, you know, in tongues in the Bible, there was a point to it. Okay? At Pentecost, it was that they were literally talking in the language that that, like when you know the tongues of cloven fire and came over in the, in when they were waiting for the Holy Spirit to come in Pentecost, people would start talking in another language that they did not know, and another person that knew that language across the room would hear them edifying and glorifying the Lord, witnessing of Jesus Christ in their language. Yet that person saying it didn't know how to speak that language. See, that's edifying. It was a primary way that the gospel was spread through tongues at Pentecost. There was a reason for it. Okay? And, and it, it wasn't just they were saying some gibberish that made no sense and, and it wasn't in a foreign language. It was just gibberish. There's no, there's no rhyme or reason to it. Why would the Holy Spirit do that? Well, basically what you're dealing with what you're dealing with modern day charismatic tongues is that gibberish. It's not another language. Now I have heard instances, this is really scary, where like let's say an American goes over to, I don't know, some other country and they start speaking in tongues, a charismatic American, or this could happen vice versa. They start speaking in other tongues and the people in the congregation look at that person in horror, and they're like, why are you cursing Jesus in our language? Whoa, now that is really scary stuff. I've heard multiple instances of that happening. So, you got to be really careful here. Um, anyway, let's go further here. Uh, let's see here. So, David Du. Uh, okay, so both babbling gibberish tongues and slain in the spirit 
are unbiblical. There were the basis, but they were the basis of the Azusa Street activities, which gave birth to Pentecostalism. Nowhere in the Bible did you he- see people being slain in the spirit, falling backwards under the power of God. It didn't happen. There's no Bible for it, in other words. David Du Plesius, a much revered figure in Pentecostalism, admitted that slain in the spirit should be avoided because it brought nothing but trouble. Now here is a revered figure in Pentecostalism saying it brought nothing but trouble. God's phenomenons do not bring this kind of trouble, but Satan's activities always do. A blanket of silence is thrown over slain and gibberish tongues because both phenomena were linked together at Azusa Street. Doubt one, and you must doubt both. So the best strategy is to just keep this whole thing quiet. The, the fact is very stark. If slain and charismatic gibberish tongues, which is the very foundation of Pentecostalism, are both unbiblical, then they are of Satan. So if both these phenomena are demonic, the whole denomination or movement is a demonic device. Potentially. However, Cardinal Sunanens, a charismatic, says that slain is the work of a, quote, alien force. Now, these are charismatics saying this. What, so what alien force can there be for Christians except a satanic one? Today's Pentecostals and charismatics have fudged the issue with bamboozling words and arguments. Note that the start of John Wimber's movement uh, the in the Toronto Blessing Vineyard, etc., contains exactly the same ingredients as those found at Azusa Street. <clears throat> we already seen a little bit about what happened at Toronto Blessing, and we'll, comp- we'll compare that with what we're looking at at Azusa Street, except it's gotten worse now. Azusa Street is in Los Angeles, California. The church there experienced its phenomenon in the first decade of the 20th century. However, the same phenomena had occurred many times before in the previous century though not in such an organized way. The man who first organized Pentecostalist ideas into a theology was Charles Parham. He has the distinction of being the father of modern-day Pentecostalism charismatic movement as well. His contemporary, or his student, was W.J. Seymour, and he helped to spread the new theology and the manifestations. He's the guy that actually was the pastor, quote, pastor at Azusa Street where this all happened. Now, everything I'm reading you here is basically either admitted or referenced, or these are all just facts that we're going over. First-hand accounts, a lot of first-hand accounts of what went on there. Um, First-hand quotes. The Azusa Street Church held its historic meetings three times a day, seven days a week, and sometimes all night as well for three years. Um, Note, how the time scale and the number of meetings coincides that with that the was the official time period of the Toronto Blessing. Uh, before it said it went longer, though. Maybe maybe it was toned down after the three years. I don't know. Uh, just as the Toronto Blessing people flocked from around the world to experience Pentecostalism, but what was experienced? Well, here's one account of somebody at the Azusa Street. Uh, this is the formation of the modern-day Pentecostal charismatic movement. Uh, a woman stood shaking from head to toe. A man in front of her slid down, slid out of his chair and became unconscious. The man, afterward, arose, staggered to them, and then began to shake his hand in front of their faces and wave his arms over their heads and moan. Then he put his hands on the heads of the women and began to shake their hair. Some of them lost control of themselves and went under a a hypnotic spell. He rubbed a man's jaw until the victim tumbled over on the floor and lay for half an hour. Then suddenly he began to jabber. Those who had received their, quote, Pentecost cried out, quote, he has the baptism, he has the baptism. See, this is where it all started, okay? So, you go into these churches, you buy into this stuff, then you're like, oh, I want that, because they're more spiritual, and I want to be more spiritual. Now, again, the Bible says in 1 Timothy 5.22, Lay hands suddenly on no man. Neither be partakers of other men's sins. Keep thyself pure. When that guy was going around laying hands on those people, he was literally imparting sin to them. 
and making them impure. It's the adopted devil program. No place does it go on more than the charismatic Pentecostal church. And it's well known that occultists and witches love these settings because they can go in there and they can speak in their pure demonic tongues with pure curses coming out of them when everybody's speaking in tongues and nobody's the wiser. Nobody has any discernment there anyway, hardly. So they can go in there and literally put curses over the whole congregation. They're some of the easiest churches to infiltrate. The Kingsway Christian Center that I went to, there were churches that were going in there, breaking in between services. There was probably somebody on staff there. And they were literally putting bones and ashes on the pews between services. We would find them like almost whenever like we would come in there. Bones and ashes. Curses. They were on the chairs. Between services. So I organized a whole bunch of people in there to pray against what was going on. We would go there, pray, and although we were misguided, you know, I don't think, you know, obviously we, we didn't want to see this going on. So I, I was the ringleader, okay, for this. And they found out about it, and who knows, it might have been one of the people with me, and they found out where I lived, and that was my whole thing on the supernatural experiences, just keying supernatural, in the keyword search box at contendingfortruth.com, they found out where I lived, and um, they they literally came to where I lived. I was I was at my parents' house actually at the time, and uh, they put a death curse on me, and that was the whole story. Where I, I I told him the supernatural thing, where I literally was taking a nap. And I woke up, I was facing the right side of the bed, and I could not move. I was paralyzed from head to toe. I couldn't even breathe. That's how paralyzed I was. I couldn't even do anything, and it was like shifting a weight, a huge weight off me just to even open my eyes. But with my eyes closed, I could see at the foot of my bed a seven-foot cone of darkness. And I knew that thing was there to kill me. It wasn't there to play patty cake. It was there to play. It was there to kill me. And I had this really huge de- desire to get my eyes opened. And it was like trying to push a five hundred pound weight off me just to get my eyes open. And I finally did. And I saw this uh, two and a half foot skeleton like demon creature. Now listen, I don't go around. This stuff doesn't happen to me. This this has never happened to me since then or before. I, I'm not like this stuff's happening all the time, like some people in the charismatic movement might say. It was about two and a half feet tall. Skeleton creature had like little armor on. And he had swords in his hand. And he was coming toward me. There was a little gap between me and the edge of the bed. And he was literally on the edge of the side of the bed, coming toward me. And I knew he was there to kill me. And I I really felt in my heart that if he got to me with those swords, I was dead. So I knew that I had to get the word Jesus out of my mouth. I knew if I could get the word Jesus out of my mouth, all of it was going to go away. Every bit of it. I knew it. See, that's faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. I knew it. Uh, Not because I'm better, not because I'm Mr. Whatever. I just knew it. There was no doubt. I knew what I had to do. But unfortunately, I was paralyzed, and I couldn't breathe. And this thing was coming toward me slowly, slowly, slowly. I'm I'm, I'm leaving some details out. You can go click on Just Keen Supernatural in the keyword search box at ContendingForTruth.com. I'll tell you the whole thing, but... um, just as it was getting ready to basically get to me, I got the word Jesus out of my mouth. And it was like, again, lifting a 500 pound rock off me. And everything instantly vanished. The little creature, the cone of darkness at the foot of my bed, everything was fine. Could breathe again, could move, everything was hunky-dory. So, I asked the Lord in prayer, I'm like, Lord, why did this happen to me? And he showed me three different things. Number one, at the head of my bed, where I was sleeping, 
there was a, and I didn't know this, I had no idea. My mom, they had a lot of garbage, little, like, they had a lot of African art and a lot of cursed objects in that house. A ton. So much so that the house was totally haunted, where we were at. Okay, I don't think the land it was built upon was was good anyway. There was a lot of um, um, prior Indian activity in that area, and the Clusa Indians were the reigning tribe, and they were as bloodthirsty as they came. So the land may have been actually cursed. Um, me being a Pentecostal, a charismatic, I had open doors just from that by itself. It wasn't like I was living in abject sin, but listen, when you're participating in this movement, you're going to have open doors, period. Okay, No matter what you do, because you're in air. You're in doctrinal air big time. Um, I hadn't figured that out yet. You have to understand, this was like I was wholeheartedly into this. Um, But the Lord had mercy. There was a black stone, like onyx, like black onyx, little idol thing, literally in the headboard, I'd say a foot and a half from literally where my head was. I didn't know it was back there. I had to slide the headboard back, and it was way back in there. It was like the Lord showed me. Got it out, destroyed it. But then he showed me other things. I went outside, and there was a mulch bed that went around the side of the house where you put mulch, and then it's like a border. And in the mulch bed, these whoever they were, these cultists, Luciferian Satanists, had literally taken a rat, it was a rat or a mouse or something. It was a rat. And I literally found a rat pinned down on its back. Each one of its little paw things were in the ground by a pin. They'd pinned this thing down and sacrificed it. How weird. But again, they will use sacrifices and blood sacrifices to seal whatever they're trying to do. And then the last thing I found, there was a cat that lived next door named Socks. Nicest cat. I love that cat. Nobody had seen Socks for a while. Well, it turns out Socks had been also, I believe, sacrificed. And he was, there was a tree that was also catty corner to where I was sleeping. And it had a mulch bed around it with a border. And it had bushes and you had to literally go, Socks started stinking really bad. Like decomposing body type thing. You, you know what that is. That smell probably. And you had to look behind the bushes and Socks was back there decomposing, and I think they had sacrificed... Socks was like only two or three years old. There was no reason that cat would have went to that mulch bed and just died there. I believe that they had done something to kill Socks as well. Now, who knows what other sacrifices they performed uh, elsewhere. But, anyway, I give a more full account of it. So, I, I know all about occultists being attracted to charismatic Pentecostal churches and how easy they are to infiltrate from an occultic standpoint which is one more reason why there's just gigantically huge problems with the movement okay uh you're the one thing about oh even a methodist or a presbyterian you're not going to have somebody going in there praying demonic tongues openly that's not going to be they they can't get away with that you know while the service is going there's just certain things you can get away with particularly in a charismatic service, that you can't get away with in other denominations. So anyway, let's go further. Um, again, back to the Bible. 1 Corinthians 14.33 For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace as in all churches of the saints. All of this praying in tongues at the same time, all of this crazy nutty behavior, slain in the spirit, holy laughter, whatever, barking like dogs, acting like chickens, whatever they're doing, that's confusion. And God is not the author of confusion. 1 Corinthians 14.40 says, Let all things be done decently and in order. Again, totally in in contrast to what goes on in these churches. 1 Timothy 3.15 That thou mayest know how thou oughtst to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. You conduct yourself properly, decently, and in order 
in the house of God. I mean, you want to be that way wherever you are, but especially in the house of God. So here's some more more first-hand testimonies of what was going on there. A young colored woman doing her best to get the gibberish. Now, you have to understand, this is the writing of the time. Okay, this is these are first-hand accounts from the time. Okay, so a young colored woman doing her best to get the gibberish, <laughs> meaning get the get the gibberish tongues, went through all kinds of contortions in her effort to get her tongue to work. A colored woman had her arms around a white man's neck, praying for him. A man of mature years leaped out of her chair, leaped out of his chair, and began to stutter. He did not utter a distinct syllable, but said tut 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 tut. <laughs> Maybe he was a King Tut fan, I don't know. This was evidence that he had, quote, the baptism. Okay? The first woman mentioned this time singing a faraway tune that sounded very unnatural and repulsive. When the altar call was made, a woman walked up to the front and kissed a man. Kissing between the sexes is a common occurrence in the tongue meetings. Now, there was a lot of inappropriate behavior that I found out, some of it I found out really after the fact, in these characters, because you do have that dynamic going on. You have this touchy-feely, laying on of hands, but see, you can get away with stuff in that environment you could never get away with in any other church. Because, oh, I, it's the, the Spirit led me to do it, to lay hands on you, and, and, and I just did what the Spirit was leading me to do there, sister. And, and stuff goes on in that environment that's way more inappropriate that you would never be able to get away with in a regular church. Okay? And I, I, I mean, I never, I was like Clark Kent, I mean, in that environment. I really was. I'm not just saying that, but I was. I, I didn't do anything inappropriate. But I found out later that some of the people that I was literally praying with and went to their houses to fellowship with, I can't even... (laughs) I'll say a little bit. There was a one lady in there. She was from England. Her name was Gail. She was a former nudist. Okay? She was the one that sponsored and hosted my Tuesday night Bible study. Okay? Okay? I thought she was over the whole nudism thing. But I found out after the fact, or toward the end when I was getting ready to get out, that Gail was, um, like, would basically wear, like, she really dressed totally inappropriately at the church. She was one of the ones that would go up there and dance before the Lord. and I mean, everything was skin tight. Um... You know, she was attractive, and and I never looked at her that way. I really didn't. I'm not saying that, but I guess a lot of guys did, I found out later. And, like, there was a friend I had who was, um, had his own ministry, ended up stealing from me later. I found this out and doing a lot of really stuff that I just couldn't even believe. And um, he was going over there to Gail's house um, to get massages in the um, spa that she had, in her community spa, at her thing. And she would come out literally wearing a shell bikini. It was literally a bikini made of shells to cover herself up. And she was giving this guy massages. Who, God knows what else was going on there. And he was married. It was one instance of stuff. There's other stuff that, I mean... I can't even get into that I found out that was self-admitted. I, I mean, one guy we went, we, we prayed at his house all the time. I found out after the fact that his wife was trying to seduce the guys that were coming over there when there was only like one guy that came over while her husband was watching like hardcore pornography. She would come in the room and like, be, like, in hardly any kind of clothes, dancing, like, trying to get the guy to sleep with her. While her husband was in the other room. And this is one of the places I went to pray. So, listen, I've seen a lot of garbage. Okay? A lot of this stuff I found out after the fact. And those people didn't, that they didn't actually come out of the church with me. But I mean, you know, it's like, 
there's so many open doors with this movement, and there's so much, and there's so. I really believe it's very, very, in a sexual way, very, very seducing and seductive. I saw it with my own eyes. I know what the fruits of this stuff are. And it's rampant. And I can't imagine what it's like now. Knowing what little that I knew. So in this particular case, an altar call was made. A woman walked up to the front and kissed a man. Kissing between the sexes. It's a common occurrence in the tongue meetings. And this was the very inception of Azusa Street, so we shouldn't be surprised at, like, the little testimony that I just gave. An eyewitness account in Demons and Tongues, which is a book written by Alma White, um, another eyewitness account in the book was a guy named Schumann, who was an author, attended a Pentecostal meeting I believe at Azusa, where pandemonium was loosed. Now, what does the word pandemonium mean? It's it's from the Greek word pan, which means all, okay, and daemon meaning demons. Pan, like a pandemic, it's over the whole world. Pandemonium, like all demons, like Tons of demons are being released. The word pandemonium means literally the abode of demons or hell or any sense of scene of wild confusion and disorder. This is this is an absolute total hallmark characteristic of these types of charismatic meetings. Pan is the demonic pagan god of sexual perversion. Pedophilia and rape. He is also portrayed roaming through the forest, drunk and and lascivious, frolicking with nymphs, and piping his way through the wild. We might say he ruled the lower nature of man, its animal base side. He has hindquarters legs and the horns of a goat, in the same manner as a fawn or a satyr. Pan is connected to fertility and the season of spring. Again, I really saw, and a lot of this was after the fact, this, this whole thing was really rampant in the charismatic church. Big time. Here's another here's another testimony. Men and women were talking excitedly in tongues. A man was holding now this is at Azusa Street. A man holding onto a post seemed to be in possession of an old fashioned Peter Cartwright camp meeting uh, charismatic style antics. Uh, case of the jerks, meaning he was jerking around. He was muttering and mumbling most of the time. He would also shriek. About 60 or 70 of the 300 present were possessed of the spirit. I refuse the word, use the word spirit with a capital S. It is not the Holy Spirit they were possessed with. And each was trying to be louder than the others. Again, this is a lot of one-upsmanship. I am more spiritual than you. I am slain in the spirit better, longer. I am jerking more. I am shrieking more. I am... It's 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 all carnal. It's it's all like it literally can turn into a competition. I want to be the most spiritual one here. <laughs> it's just it's a recipe for disaster. And as I read this stuff, I'm like, oh yeah, I can totally relate to this. I remember, you know, being there when this type of behavior took place. I saw so much crazy stuff in the very short time I was in this movement. That I'm sure I've forgotten way more than I'll ever remember. The insanity, the charlatans that I saw speak. It's just unbelievable. One of the three men leading the meeting was praying, kneeling upon an open Bible. You're telling me you got an open Bible and you're putting your knees on it? That's evil. That's blasphemous. You should, the Bible wasn't meant to have your knees put on it. What is that garbage? He was almost beside himself with excitement. His arms waved and his body swayed. I thought that he might be heard two blocks away. In this meeting, there was barking like dogs. Remember, we just heard about Toronto Blessing. That was one of the things they were doing. Hooting like owls. I've heard, I've read accounts also people slithering like snakes up the aisles. 
uh, and the like. After adjourning, one of the leaders remarked in my hearing that, quote, God had a wonderful hold on this meeting for a little while, didn't he? Now, and then the same man added, God, God's got a crowd of oh, folks here that's willing to let him make fools if he want them to. Fools of themselves, basically, if he want them to. So God's going to have everybody acting like a bunch of idiots and fools. No, the Holy Spirit doesn't work that way. And now I'm not sure the one guy in this article means that God had a hold on the meeting until all the pandemonium broke loose, but I think what the guy was saying was that God had a hold on the meeting when everybody was acting like idiots. You, you could interpret it either way. Either way is bad. I can remember my pastor at that charismatic church I told you about. I can remember him on more several occasions when people were praying in tongues and going nuts and doing all the theatrics. Okay? I can remember him going up on stage and saying this. He says, you know, and, and, and it literally would be going on right in front of him. Okay? Like somebody would be going nuts, jerking whatever they were doing, going crazy, screaming, acting like a moron. And he would say, you know, I've heard, you know, a lot of talk about the Holy Spirit, that, you know, he's a gentleman and stuff. He says, but let me tell you something. <laughs> from what I'm seeing here, and from what I've seen several times, the Holy Spirit's no gentleman. Let me tell you. I heard him say that on, I don't know how many occasions. Because he would look at the fruit of what was going on. Was, I believe his name is Corden, Pastor Corden. He got caught up in some sexual thing too. Got booted. You know, had to go to another church. I think he went to Arizona or something. <laughs> he said that on several occasions. He would go up there and say, I'm the kind of guy that if somebody does me wrong, I'm like, oh, I want to kill him. That's what he would say, okay? And then he says, but my wife's the kind of person because she's German, that would say, would come up to me, and, he, and she would say, yes, but how? How can we kill them? I mean, he would he would just go up there and talk about this stuff, and I guess, me looking back on it now, it's like, wow, what was I thinking? Why was I staying there? What was I, but see, I was really blind. I was really caught up in the moment. I was caught up in the whole, wow, we're really spiritual. We're really better. So we can do this. We're doing all this stuff that other churches aren't doing because we're more spiritual. And God's not striking us dead, so we must be okay with God. It must be good. It must be right. Because what we're doing is so radically different than other churches. We're just so spiritual, and we're so with it. It's like 1 Corinthians 5. We are literally, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 5, about a man taking his... Uh, father's wife to be his wife that they're glorying in their shame and that we're we're so with it that we're actually ordained to do these works like the Bible talks about in Jeremiah 5 Jeremiah 11 and Jeremiah 17 I believe where church gets so deluded that it actually thinks it has this right to sin and act just insane. And that's where we were at. That's where our thinking processes were. A lot of the stuff I've never said on air before, what I said tonight. But it's kind of appropriate because I'm looking at this and I'm like, yeah, I, I remember that. <laughs> I remember a lot of stuff. Bad stuff. Now that I look back on it. Uh, yeah, but... <laughs> I can't tell you many times he said the Holy Spirit's no gentleman. Because, see, in his mind, he's seen people getting slain in the Spirit, and then sometimes they wouldn't get caught. I remember one time this lady got supposedly slain in the Spirit. She fell back. Nobody was there to catch her. Her head hit a guitar case, like somebody had a guitar case back there. And, man, it sounded like, I mean, it was so loud. It was like a melon bouncing off a, I mean, it was so loud, the the sound that it made. It didn't seem to hurt her. She didn't see, now I don't know if like later she was like, whether she was just embarrassed or whatever, but I mean, people get hurt 
people don't get caught. Things happen. People fall down. I mean, people get injured. You know? And if the Holy Spirit was part of this, why would that be happening? Now, going back to the main article. Do you re- report? Do you not find all this frightening? This could be a description of a modern Toronto-style meeting. Note that the leader kneeling on the word of God, the pandemonium, the sexual activity, the same manifestations, the suggestion that God had control of only a small part of the meeting, thus Satan had the rest, the making of fools of people. It's also worth noting that early Pentecostal congregates were commonly ordered out of town by the police because of the racket they made and because of their general misconduct. This is not fruit of the Holy Spirit. Okay, and again, this is all, these are all reference quotes I'm reading you here of first-hand quotes that happened. Another eyewitness said, I found men and women lying on the floor in all shapes. They were jabbering all at one time in what was called unknown tongues. See, this was not prevalent then. While I was praying, one of the workers took hold of me and said, Holy Ghost, we command thee to go into this soul. The workers were jabbering and shaking their hands over me, and the demonic power, as I now know, took possession of me. And I fell among the people on the floor and knew nothing for ten hours. I went into trances. uh, Two or three different, no, probably more than that, occasions like a trance like that, where you would just literally like go into almost a statue. And I didn't go for the 10 hours. But for a while, I admit it. So I'm not saying, I'm not up here saying, oh, I'm so much better than this, I've never let myself be. No, I man, I did it all. I, I did a lot of stuff, you know, it, along these lines. I didn't do any of the bad sexual stuff. Um, but I did the slain in the spirit, the, the, the um, Tongues, the um, hypnotic trance stuff, uh, you know, travailing in the spirit, you know, that whole stuff. Anyway, uh, let's go further. Not proud of it, but, you know, uh, let's see here. So they were lying on the floor, shapes. So they, they commanded the Holy Spirit going to this person. Uh, let's see. When I came to my senses, I was weak. My jaws were so tired, they ached. I believed then that this was the power of God. They said I was wonderfully blessed, and the leader sent me from one place to another so I could jabber in tongues. So I guess you could spread the spread the demonic stuff around. Now, note, they supposedly commanded the Holy Spirit. You don't tell the Holy Spirit what to do. You know what I mean? But just like they do today. You know, this is just blasphemy. When W.J. Seymour preached at Azusa Street, the meetings were called a revival. Why? Because the so-called slains in the spirit and the tongues were combined. To these early Pentecostalists, they were, quote, proof that God was with them in a powerful way. The hard fact is, all manifestations were those found in the demonic realm. One who took part in these early years, Bartleman, said, it was also reported that the jerks and the treen, the devil, uh, this is my, 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 the worst one, They said that the jerks and the treen of the devil. Now, treen. You know what that means? When, like, let's say somebody goes out hunting and they got their blue tick hound. And they tree a coon. Okay? Meaning, they chase a raccoon up a tree and the hunters come by and it's in the tree and the hunters can shoot it. Okay? That's what a coon dog does. Well, they said that when you when you're walking on all fours and barking up a tree like a dog, that's called treeing the devil. Supposedly, you're 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 on your knees at this Azusa Street revival, and you're you're on all fours like a dog, and you're barking like there's a tree in front of you, and that's called treeing the devil. Barking up a tree like a dog because you got the devil up the tree instead of a raccoon. This was all in evidence at the Azusa Street Mission. Can you imagine? That's something I never even seen. I never saw anybody going around barking. But I've seen that Toronto Blessing. Yeah. I saw one lady, it's, it's in one of those videos where uh, some guy or is, is, is barking like a dog walking around. And, and I'm pretty sure they have some kind of leash around him. 
And then this this lady's in the background, this Christian lady, and she says, Oh, isn't that special? Where where he leads, they shall follow. Meaning this guy's leading this guy around on a leash. And he's barking like a dog. And this woman's quoting, Where they lead, they shall follow, like in the Bible. Oh my word. I mean, these people are so deluded. Now that again, that's one I never even saw. Anyway, Bartleman in favor of the movement and not wanting to write anything negative, refers to a Baptist pastor who ran around hugging everyone he could get a hold of. This was called, quote, divine love. Remember all this and the kissing all took place in a time in history when such behavior would have been shocking, yet it was accepted as of God without question. One missionary leader spoke with horror about what happened at Azusa Street, declaring that it would be impossible to publish the things that have occurred here. The familiarity between the sexes in the public meeting has been shocking, to say the least. Hell has reaped an awful harvest, and infidelity has become more strongly rooted than ever before. Hey, it's no big stretch when you're in a meeting like this. If you if you see some woman, and let's say your, your wife or your husband aren't a part of this, and you are, and you see some woman, and you you all of a sudden get this thing like, oh, the Holy Spirit's telling me she needs to be my wife, or I need to sleep with her, and show her holy love. And you go out and cheat on your wife, or you divorce your wife, she divorces her husband, so they can be, you know, this stuff happens all the time. I mean, it happens in every denomination, but it'll happen way more in a setting like this. Hell has reaped an awful harvest and infidelity has become more strongly rooted than ever before. All along in these descriptions, we are reading carbon copies of Toronto Blessing and the other charismatic annex. Sexual impropriety is rife as is marital breakdown and other problems. It's reaping rotten fruit right from the very start. Ungodly fruit. Also, the occurrences at Azusa Street soon attracted the attention of occultists far and wide. What did I, did, weren't we just talking about this? With the witches and the warlocks infiltrating? Well, sure. From the very inception, this movement attracted occultists world, far and wide. They did, they did so not because God was in the movement, but because he was not. Spiritualists and mediums from numerous occult societies in Los Angeles, began to attend and contribute their seances and trances to the services. <laughs> hey, we need to help you out here. So the witches and the warlocks show up, and they're going to contribute their occult cursings and prayers and seances and trances to the services. Again, this is all referenced. Everything I'm reading you. I would ask Pentecostals to read that statement again. Does it not tell you something about the true foundational nature of your denomination. Seymour was terrified by these activities, meaning the the, um, the, the preacher at Azusa Street. Uh, this took place in the middle of the, of the church services. He wrote frantically to Charles Parham, the guy that he was the student of, the guy that's credited as the founder of the modern-day Pentecostal movement, Charles Parham. He begged him to come to Los Angeles to short, uh, sort things out. W.J. Seymour was still writing urgent letters appealing for help as spiritualistic manifestations, hypnotic forces, and fleshly contortions uh, as known in the colored camp meetings in the South had broken loose in these meetings. Now, remember, the slaves, okay, the blacks, and I'm not being prejudicial here. I'm saying, where did the black slaves come from that we brought over? And I say we because I'm a white person, okay? Brought over from Africa. Where did they come? Well, brought from Africa. Okay? Do you think they didn't bring that religion with them? This is where voodoo got started in Haiti. Okay? Bringing them over. Okay? And then this happened. This is a manifestation. I'm not saying they were all bad. But I'm saying that you have generational witchcraft at play here. Okay, so it was more prevalent, let's say, in these other meetings. Because of that generational witchcraft, okay? I'm not being prejudicial. I'm just saying that this had something to do with it. If it was white people that had brought it over, I'd be equally pointing that out as well. 
Okay, and I'm not saying the white people are, are, are innocent, but in this particular case, I think that had something to do with it. He wanted to know which parts were real and which parts were false. This is W.J. Seymour uh, to Charles Parham. Okay, It did not enter his mind that it was all false, though. The manifestations he refers to are exactly those that were shown in the Rodney Howard Brown, Rodney Howard Brown Copeland, Benny Hinn, and other charismatic meetings during and since the Toronto Blessings, and they then proceeded to go to Pensacola. That's the whole Pensacola Revival. That's a whole other thing. I went there. I went to the Pensacola Revival. Okay? Went there front row, man. Huh. The whole Pentecostal shebang. I experienced it there, too. So, I mean, I was really on the front lines of this stuff. So that's why this subject kind of near and dear to me. As Nader... McKaylee correctly observes, how could an outpouring of the Spirit of God attract witches, the mediums, and the spiritualists? Fragrance does not attract flies. A decomposing carcass does. Mediums and spiritualists are attracted to the spirit that is at work in them. And that was in this revival meeting. The only answer is that the events at Azusa Street were not of God at all, but were of Satan. That has serious ramifications. That Pentecostalism is based not on the work of God, but on the work of Satan. As we have said many times, this has nothing to do with how nice a person is, or how holy he claims to be, or how much he says he loves Jesus, etc. What matters is how he obeys the Lord's commands as found in Scripture. Azusa Street did not obey the Lord, but propagated perversions of truth. What followed, therefore, was also a perversion, which continues to this very day. Again, to quote, quote, quote this McHale uh, man, he said, did the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost attract mediums and spiritualists to participate with the disciples? No, of course it did not. Now, this is the guy writing this article. He says, sometimes I've discovered in my own work that it work is that the mediums and spirit, spiritualists are powerless in the presence of God. I have noted how spiritualists have been dumb when I've been near, and I've watched a man overtaken by a demon, crawl into a corner, crying out that I leave him alone because I knew, I quote, knew God. He was forced to crawl and snivel just as demons cry out to Jesus not to harm them. This happened not because of my own strength or holiness, but because of the master I represented. I had no power of my own, yet even the derived delegated authority of a mortal sinful Christian was enough to send demons scurrying away. So I like how he humbles himself and says, listen, it's not because I'm Mr. Holier than thou, you know, that this happened. Um, why did they not scatter at Azusa Street, is the question, if this was so holy, so righteous. Why were witches and warlocks attracted to this like flies to a de- decomposing carcass? I think you can already guess the answer. The power of Satan was so strong that the supernatural atmosphere at Azusa Street was felt with for several blocks If it had been the power of God, mediums and spiritualists would not have been able to enter that hallowed area. Instead, they flocked there and joined in the revelry because they recognized that the same spirit as they had was present at Azusa Street. Great points this man is making here. Today, the revival is considered by historians to be the primary catalyst for the spread of Pentecostalism. Um, In the 1900s, William J. Seymour was a student of a well-known preacher, Charles Parham. I've already kind of covered this a little bit, but I'm going to go a little bit further. Seymour and other revivalists at the Apostolic Faith Mission on Azusa Street held to a core beliefs of, number one, salvation by obeying Acts 2.38 through repentance, baptism, and the infilling of the Holy Ghost evidenced by speaking in tongues as the Spirit gave utterance. So in other words, your salvation was dependent on repentance, baptism, I don't see anything about accepting the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. Repentance, baptism, and the infilling of the Holy Ghost, evidenced by you speaking in tongues. So now, again, this is where we get this doctrine from charismania. Oh, you're not speaking, oh, brother, you're not really saved. we got to get you speaking in tongues so you can get saved. Oh, I have to accomplish this gift? This this works-based thing now? Evidently? <laughs> so it's a false gospel is what's going on here. Uh, here's another um, 
report from from this actual meeting. It says a disgraceful intermingling of sexes and races. They cry and make howling noises all day into the night. They jump, run, shake all over, shout to the top of their voice, spin around in circles, fall out on saw sawdust blanketed floor, jerking, kicking, rolling all over it. Some of them pass out and do not move for hours as though they were dead. These people appear to be mad, mentally deranged, or under a spell. They claim to be filled with the Spirit. They have an illiterate preacher who stays on his knees much of the time with his head hidden between wooden milk crates. He doesn't talk very much, but at times he can be heard shouting, Repent! And he's... I mean, they should be repenting, yeah, but isn't this ironic? He's saying repent. <laughs> and yet they're... they're they're openly participating in all this manner of wickedness. <laughs> he shouts, repent, and he's supposed to be running the thing. They repeatedly sing the same song. The Comforter has come. Why? Because everybody's speaking in tongues and everybody's getting slain in the spirit. Everybody's acting like a bunch of morons and farm animals out there. So that means the Comforter has come. Do you realize that's almost like, really like almost blasphemy in the Holy Spirit? You're attributing a wicked, evil work to the Comforter, capital C, the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit didn't have anything to do with this. Who, who's, um, that was said by, that last quote was said by the Azusa History International Center for Spiritual Revival. Um, and there's a link to it. So, yeah, this is what we're dealing with here. This is very interesting. This next sentence these next few sentences, this next paragraph. Two events shook California in April of 1906 and forever changed its history. This is, this is, wow, I didn't know this. The first was recorded on the front page of the Los Angeles Daily News the morning of April 18th, 1906, which read, quote, Weird Babble of Tongues, heard from a new sect of fanat- fanatics breaking loose at a former livery or livery stable at 312 Azusa Street, downtown Los Angeles. The reporter described a mixed congregation of blacks and whites, which at, at one time in itself was newsworthy, that began howling and swaying in such a frenzy that no one could understand their utterances. Screams of repent were the only audible words that could be heard coming from Azusa Street Revival. Now think about it. If you were a devil, or if you were a demon or whatever, wouldn't that be a good way to like keep your cover? Have them, have them try to say pseudo-holy word like, repent! Repent. Oh, he's been baptized with the Holy Spirit. Counterfeit Christianity is what we're dealing with here. Okay? That's what we're dealing with. Oh, wow, it sounds real good. Repent. When they're, and as they're, as they're like doing all manner of wickedness. But see, that way the devils can keep their, if they were screaming out fornicate, you would know right away, oh, well, this is a devil. Oh, no, but it's saying repent. It can't be, it can't be of the devil. See how the, 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 the devil's good at what he does? The second shock that hit the same day, April 18th, 1906, same day that this, that this came out, the front page of the Los Angeles Daily News, weird babble of tongues, new sect of fanatics breaking loose. The same day, April 18th, 1906, at 5 a.m., a horrendous earthquake hit San Francisco, California. The shock waves were felt from Los Angeles to Oregon, to the Pacific Ocean. There was destruction, death, and desolation that shook the very core of the hearts of those involved in the destruction and those that were watching from afar. There were two more earthquakes in Los Angeles just before noon, causing more panic and uncertainty out of the chaos and uncertainty came the birthplace of the Pentecostal movement revival. Wow. You think maybe God had something to do with that earthquake? Of his absolute total disgust and displeasure of what was kicking off here? All in the name of God. All attributing this this evil, demonic behavior to the Holy Spirit? That's not something you do. I mean, when they said, 
He casteth out devils by the prince of devils to Jesus Christ. He says, all manner of sin will be forgiven, man. But when you accuse me, Jesus Christ, of casting out devils by the prince of devils, number one, a house divided itself cannot stand, and you're attributing an evil work to the Holy Spirit. That's called blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, and that will not be forgiven, ever. Now, I'm not saying they had committed that. I'm just saying that, boy, oh boy, not something... you got to be real careful of what you're attributing to the Holy Spirit. This is obviously demonic. This is obviously totally evil. And yet they're saying it's a work of... So, in other words, it's like they're blaming the Holy Spirit for their wicked behavior. Well, the Holy Spirit made me do it. I mean, I, I can't help it. I, I acted like a total reprobate, um, demon-possessed idiot. The Holy Spirit made me do it, so blame him. I mean, that, that is, that is, man, that's scary. Really scary. In 1907, Charles Parham was arrested and charged with sodomy in Texas and lost all credibility with the neo-Pentecostal movement he had started. Kind of sounds like good old Todd Odd Bentley, convicted child molester, yeah, I told you, I went to the, the meeting, came out that week that he was cheating on his wife with another lady openly. And then something else happened too. Two things to shut it down. Charles Parham, he was the guy that, that was the uh, mentor for uh, the Seymour at the Zusa Street. He was arrested and charged with sodomy in Texas in 1907. This is just a year after the Azusa Street thing was getting ramped up. For, for Pentecostals, the events of the Azusa Street marked the watershed event in modern Pentecostalism. Yet look at what contemporary Orthodox and theologians said about it. <clears throat> J. Campbell Morgan described the Azusa Street activities as the last vomit of Satan. Um, these are all reference quotes. R.A. Torrey declared that this new Pentecostal movement was emphatically not of God and founded by a sodomite. Uh, three, H.A. Ironside said both the holiness and the Pentecostal movements were disgusting, delusions, and insanities. In 1912, he said of their meetings that pandemoniums were exhibitions worthy of a madhouse or a collection of howling uh, dervishes were causing a heavy toll of lunacy and infidelity. Yeah, people were cheating probably on their spouses like crazy, fornicating like, you know, this is what this breeds. Literally. J.B. Godby said of the Azusa Street participants, they were Satan's preachers, jugglers, and necromancers, enchanters, magicians, and all sorts of medicants. He claimed the movement was the result of spiritualism. You got all the witches and the warlocks and the occultists and the pagans flocking to your meeting, and they're not being offended. That's not, that doesn't speak highly of what you're doing. And again, this was the modern-day underpinnings, the foundation of the modern-day Pentecostal charismatic movement. Clarence Larkin said, quote, But the conduct of those possessed, in which they fall to the ground and writhe in contortions, causing disarrangements of clothing and disgraceful scenes, is more characteristic of demon possession than the work of the Holy Spirit. From what has been said, we will we see that we are living in perilous times and that it's all about seducing spirits and that they will become more active as this dispensation draws to a close and we must exert the greatest care lest we be led astray. So, number one, uh, here is um, a little bit more information. It is an indisputable, an indisputable fact that Parham, um, Charles Parham, guy that was credited as a modern-day starter of the modern-day Pentecostal movement, rejected several of, of the central tenets of the Christian faith, and that he was charged with sodomy. It is a fact, according to many eyewitnesses, including Parham, that Azusa was overrun with spiritualist mediums, witches, and hypnotists who were attracted to, Azusa, to Azusa's manifestations. And here's the guy that trained the guy that started this, and he's even saying this, who got convicted of sodomy. And was thrown in jail. I remember there was a guy that came to that Pentecostal church. 
And I'm almost positive he had, yeah, he had a book, and it was called God's Generals. Okay? And this is a guy who just got started in the ministry, but all of a sudden he was rising real fast. Had this book, and it, it went through all of these reprobates, like Parham and Woodworth Eddy, we talk about her, and, and Catherine Kuhlman, I've done teachings on her, exposing that devil. And all of these guys, I think Branham maybe, and A.A. And a. A. Allen, devils, okay? That so many Pentecostals and Charismatics just still point to to this day. And he had this book, and it's called God's Generals. These were God, no, it should have been Satan's Generals. Every one of those people that he said, you could have literally wrote a book on all of their wicked activities. I could do it. Multi, multi-part teachings on all of them, exposing them easily from just newspaper and in in eyewitness accounts and things that were that they did. And he had the audacity. And you know what? The guy that wrote that book it wasn't too long after that that he got um, that he got outed for being a homosexual. He he wrote this book, God's Generals. He just had the, he had the God and Satan mixed up though, I guess, on the cover. Okay, then a little bit more. By the end of 1913, there were growing factions within the fledgling movement, and in and in the end, several independent Pentecostal organizations were formed due to not being able to resolve their leadership and doctrinal differences. This is what happens with all cults. They start, there's certain things where they can't get on the same page, so then they start to splinter, and then they start to grow that way. This is why we have so many denominations. This is why how Pentecostal got splintered from the very start. Okay, it was it was born in confusion and strife, and and then it, it just continued in that direction. So, four organizations exist today, and then they've I'm sure they've had more splinterings and splinterings as a result of this first modern Azusa thing. Number one, the Church of God in Christ, which are Black Pentecostals, that was formed in 1907. Then, the Assemblies of God, which were the white Pentecostals, that was formed in 1914. Assemblies of God, I mean, that's a big, big denomination. And then, the United Pentecostal Church, both black and white members, that was formed in 1914. And then the Pentecostal Church of God, mostly white members, formed in 1919. Okay, so, um, that's, I'm going to stop here, and then we're going to go uh, into a pre-Pentecostal historical timeline where I'm going to get into some of the pre-Pentecostal history and um, I'm not going to go into exhaustive but I'm going to do a little bit so you have uh, also a little more background on that as well. So, uh, God bless you and we'll see you in part four.